At long last, we arrive at part nine of Beyond Good and Evil, which Nietzsche entitles What is Noble. And in this final chapter of the work, Nietzsche gives us an articulation of what you could call his affirmative philosophy, but I don't want to give the impression that this is somehow separate from the rest of what we've talked about in analyzing this work, because in many ways, what Nietzsche does here is simply to take a few further steps from ideas that he has already sketched out throughout the book. And so without any further ado, uh, we're going to start with 257. Quote, Every enhancement of the type man has so far been the work of an aristocratic society, and it will be so again and again, a society that believes in the long ladder of an order of rank and differences in value between man and man, and that needs slavery in some sense or other. Without that pathos of distance which grows out of the ingrained difference between strata, when the ruling caste constantly looks afar and looks down upon subjects and instruments, and just as constantly practices obedience and command, keeping down and keeping at a distance, that other more mysterious pathos could not have grown up either. The craving for an ever new widening of distances within the soul itself, the development of ever higher, rarer, more remote, further stretching, more comprehensive states, in brief, simply the enhancement of the type man, the continual self-overcoming of man, to use a moral formula in a supra-moral sense. Uh, end quote. The first thing I want to um, argue here is that Nietzsche is talking about society, as he says in this passage, but there's something much, much bigger going on here. We did talk about this section last season during the political discussions and a lot of the aphorisms, especially in sort of the first half of this chapter, we discussed at length during uh, season three. So if you want more elaboration on some of these aphorisms, you can find it there. But the first thing that I would point out here, which is far, far deeper than any political consideration, is the assertion of the idea of the order of rank and the pathos of distance. Pathos here meaning something like a feeling, a feeling for di distance, having distance being a fundamentally good thing. The separation between, um, we might say, I mean, Nietzsche in this uh, section is explicitly talking about castes. I mean, we might think of the, the Hindu caste system of literally rank ordering people according to their value and then keeping a distance between them. And this sounds abhorrent to modern people. Nietzsche, uh, he does have his problems with the Manu Law Book of India, it, it doesn't have to do with the caste system, though. Uh, in some of his notes, he complains that the Brahmin, the holy man, is made into the top of the uh, the top caste of society. Which the significance of this beyond the political is that that is the Indian society saying the priestly type is of the highest value. That whichever type of person is placed at the top of the social hierarchy is a representative of what that society idealizes and values. And again, though we modern people might be very much opposed to things like caste systems, Nietzsche would be very quick to point out that society itself, civilization itself, is premised on this hierarchy of values. First and foremost, I mean, this is the reason why I say it's deeper than anything political, is because Nietzsche believes that as living beings, we are thereby valuing beings, and as valuing beings, um, the you you must have this sort of hierarchy of values. Now, I sort of even hesitate to say that you must have this because we could imagine somebody eschewing such a thing. But I think Nietzsche would say that if for life to eschew a hierarchy of values is in some sense to eschew valuing, which is to. Um, basically undermine the premise of life itself. That valuing in and of itself presupposes an order of rank, because if you value one thing, that means you value it over other things. And, um, you know, there may be a number of different things that you value, but there's always going to be a hierarchy of importance because some things will be more useful or more advantageous to you or better fulfill your ideals for how the world should be. Very hard to speak about this in general terms, but I think 
uh, it gets the point across that living is valuing and valuing is rank ordering. And therefore, as living beings that have created polities, we have thereby rank ordered people. And again, whether or not we agree with such a thing, because in modern times, we could say that something like a caste system, our, our value judgments nowadays have rank ordered the type of society with a caste system as being of lesser moral value than our more modern democratic uh, meritocratic societies. But again, something Nietzsche might point out to us is that we still have the hierarchy and the order of rank within this structure. And that even within societies which were great experiments in doing away with any sort of hierarchy, for example, we look at like the Soviet Union or uh, communist China or any number of other examples, you still have to value, I mean, the Soviet Union placed a very high value on scientific minds, on expert chess players, on you know in engineering knowledge i mean they they were they became the first people to go into outer space right and they didn't do that all of the the accomplishments that they managed to attain and they did in spite of what you know you may hear these days the soviet union did have plenty of accomplishments none of that was uh premised on an egalitarian approach to let's say solving scientific problems Right, And I think I've just pointed this out before, but it's worth noting to get across, I think, the general point or the fundamental point that Nietzsche is stressing here is that um, when we really care about something, when it is actually of true value to us, we do not pursue it in the style of these modern ideas. So, for example, if you have a scientific problem to solve, you don't solve it democratically. You solve it by expertise in science by appe appealing to the greatest minds within the field to um, tackle the problem. And while we might say that we don't um, necessarily, we're not in line with Nietzsche's idea of the pathos of distance, of keeping these sorts of, um, you know, because in a meritocratic society, we are, the, our society is more based on fluidity between classes of people, right? You can do or be anything you want to be so long as you um, apply yourself and uh, work hard and uh, do a good job, right? It's not necessarily true. I think that is uh, largely, um, that's been greatly embellished, but there is some truth to that, right? And it certainly is the, represents the value system of our society, even if that isn't necessarily the reality. Regardless of that, we could still apply the idea of the pathos of distance insofar as we would want to keep the people who are of no merit out of the meritorious institutions and positions of power, wouldn't we? At least insofar as, you know, you wouldn't want somebody who has no doesn't have a medical degree operating on you, keep that person out of that position. And this may just seem like, well, Keegan, you're just stating the normal uh, conventional meritocratic view. Well, yes, I am, but I'm trying to point out the ways in which these ideas, even with the fluidity of how our um, hierarchy works today, even with the fact that uh, we have these ideas that people are all basically equal, even if they might have differing abilities, Nietzsche would, I think, be the one to undermine our overconfidence in you know, the fact that we're realizing these Christian or Platonic values on earth, that in fact, the order of rank and the pathos of distance, to the extent that we are still living beings and we are still human, are woven into everything that we do. And again, Nietzsche is specifically talking about it in a political sense here and talking about how we, we might say that manifestation of a hierarchy of value within the political sphere enhanced human beings, in his opinion, this is a consequence. It's a further step from the understanding of what life is in Nietzsche's view and what civilization is, which he'll talk about that more in this, this section. But let's continue with the text. Quote, to be sure one should not yield to humanitarian illusions about the origins of an aristocratic society and thus of the presupposition of this enhancement of the type man, truth is hard. 
Let us admit to ourselves, without trying to be considerate, how every higher culture on earth so far has begun. Human beings whose nature was still natural, barbarians in every terrible sense of the word, men of prey who were still in possession of unbroken strength of will and lust for power, hurled themselves upon weaker, more civilized, more peaceful races, perhaps traders or cattle raisers, or upon mellow old cultures whose last vitality was even then flaring up in splendid fireworks of spirit and corruption. In the beginning, the noble caste was always the barbarian caste. Their predominance did not lie mainly in physical strength, but in strength of the soul. They were more whole human beings, which also means, at every level, more whole beasts. End quote. So, I would point out first the ways in which this entire chapter is a preliminary text to the uh, work in Genealogy of Morality, which Nietzsche said as much. It's an elaboration on this text. And so if you've already read Genealogy of Morality, or if you're familiar with the basic ideas, Nietzsche begins that project here, and notice what this second half of 257 has in common with a lot of his work in Genealogy of Morality. Nietzsche is speaking descriptively. Now, as to what he advocates for or approves of, people argue about that to this day, but it doesn't really matter, is what I would first and foremost argue. Because what Nietzsche says here, truth is hard. And then he says a very, very hard truth, that the premise of civilization is domination, exploitation, as he says earlier, slavery. That... Um, the origins of aristocratic societies were barbarian peoples throwing themselves on uh, weaker peoples and um, establishing themselves as a noble class above them. And so arguing about Nietzsche's political opinions, I think, is a bit of a distraction. And it's actually a way of maybe squirming away from that Nietzsche's prescriptive statements to the extent that they exist in, in this chapter, and they, they do exist. I'm not going, one of those people who says Nietzsche doesn't make any prescriptive statements because he does. But we have to be, um, <laughs> we have to be able to rank order in our evaluations of what's important in his work, the descriptive, I think, above the prescriptive. Because everything that Nietzsche says prescriptively is premised on these uh, descriptive claims about the way things are. And I mean, that again, that might seem rather obvious to state, but I think it's something that people get confused about. Because certainly, if everything Nietzsche is saying descriptively here is false, then any of his prescriptions based on that are going to be utter nonsense. So the hard truth that he's trying to present here is this idea of civilization as emerging out of barbarism, and as an act of conquest and domination, that that's what you find at the gates of human cultures, not a Rousseauian, uh, you know, utopian state where everyone shared everything and men and women were equal and, uh, you know, the land, there was no sense of ownership over the land. And, uh, you know, it's not as if it was a paradise, but everyone had what they needed and could get what they needed with their own uh, two hands, right? That this is simply not the case. And modern historians, I think, would largely agree with Nietzsche. There are complications here, of course, of course. But the Rousseauian idea, I think, is Nietzsche's main target here. The Rousseauian conception of nature, but also, we might say, the Hobbesian conception of civilization insofar, uh, or certainly the Lockean conception, insofar as civilization does not represent the um, extrication of mankind from this state of war and state of um, domination and exploitation between human beings, but that it is an objectification of that very state of affairs from the very beginning. And the reason why this is such a hard truth is because it implies that all of the good things of culture, all of the things that we universally love, like art and science and the enhancement of mankind, 
are premised on that very uh, exploitative um, project of civilization. Like if civilization itself is inherently exploitative, because that's what life is, then all of the good things that we reap from civilization are products of exploitation. And suppose you can't have one without the other. Do we, um, like Rousseau said, declare that, well, therefore the arts and sciences uh, are of no value, they've done nothing but harm mankind, and it would be better to return to being noble beasts, noble savages. And uh, it's sort of a funny way for me to put that, right? Because for one, Rousseau, I don't think he used the term noble savage, but um, Nietzsche's talking about what is noble and the way he describes these more complete human beings who were the first aristocracies is that they were more complete beasts. They were uh, more whole human beings. What does he mean by that? Well, they're more well integrated. Um, I think reading the untimely meditation, Use and Abuse of History for Life is very informative on this point that the way Nietzsche sees the ancient Greeks is that the knowledge that they had internally, the things that they felt internally, their internal states matched more with their external existence. What does that mean? It means that the knowledge they have is practical knowledge. It means that education for them is not simply accruing trivial information, but it is being educated for life, which is Nietzsche's goal as well. Again, one could debate whether the Greeks or any of these ancient peoples were actually like this. But from a psychological standpoint, you could certainly argue, and I think it would be difficult to argue against, that a lot of the, what might we say, sense of incompleteness that people have um, in modern times and in modern civilization springs a lot of the time from the fact that they feel as though they have no way of venting or expressing their power in a real sense in the world. And people have all of these surrogate means of uh, expressing power or feeling their power. Nietzsche, for example, has spoken about the scholar and the, uh, this entire institutional pursuit of knowledge and rank within the institution which might be a way of um, experiencing your power. But that the embodiment of power and the expression of it in a physical sense, of uh, venting it onto the world, externalizing it, right? This was something that the quote-unquote barbarian had that we do not. That he didn't have to have recourse to any of these um, like surrogates for expressing his power because he simply lived in it. That was simply his reality within the um, life or death struggle within nature. One never loses sight of, uh, or never loses perspective on how powerful they actually are and what the nature of their existence is as a living being. It's a war, it's a struggle for territory, it's a, it's a struggle to come out on top and notice Nietzsche speaks about flaring up in splendid fireworks of spirit and corruption. This is uh, him talking about, say, maybe older societies that were conquered or sort of lost their vitality. A lot of this uh, is borne out by the work of Peter Turchin, uh, which we talked about last uh, season. Um, it's also written about in Ibn Khaldun's Muhadima. Uh, which I think both those episodes would be very informative to sort of concretizing what Nietzsche is talking about here in very general terms. But one of the aspects of, of sort of a later culture, which has become sedate, less warlike, more peaceable, is that this is where they reap the harvest of culture in terms of arts and sciences and, um, you know, all of these sort of great works and productivity of the mind. And, uh, so these, I think, are the splendid fireworks of spirit and corruption. What is the corruption? Well, they begin to get these uh, ideas that are, uh, we might say, symptoms of late or later civilizations insofar as they begin to believe in the abolition of all hierarchy. And they begin to entertain notions which can only exist in this abstract platonic sense 
They can't ever really be truly realized within society or within civilization or within the physical world because they are, in Nietzsche's view, anti-life. But these ideas of like absolute egalitarianism and the leveling of uh, all hierarchy, ab abolition of all distinctions and differences, erasure of all boundary lines, dividing lines. And so, I again, I want to take this away from the concrete in many ways and look at what Nietzsche is saying in an abstract sense. I know I'm, I'm being uh, too platonic, right? But I want to, I do want to abstract it away from the it, it, political instantiation of what he might be saying, because I think that puts a lot of people off or it, it's kind of distracting because it gets us into that prescriptive thinking. Whereas what he's saying descriptively is very, very profound about what the nature of life is, valuing, what the nature of valuing is, hierarchy, and what the necessity of maintaining hierarchy entails, pathos of distance, dividing lines. And all of this he finds within the ancient Greeks, which we've discussed at length. And so with that, we'll move on to 258. 258 is the passage about the Sipo Matador, I'm not going to read this passage because uh, it was the topic of the first episode of season three, entitled The Sepal Matador. If you didn't listen to that episode or if you need a refresher, The Sepal Matador is a vine which exists in the Brazilian rainforest. Uh, here, um, Kaufman says it comes from Java, but uh, this is a plant that grows up through the canopies of the rainforest seeking the sun and because that's what the plants are fighting for in the rainforest right there's there's sort of like a a hierarchy of you know the most vital powerful organisms are the tallest trees that can stretch above all of the others and steal the sunlight from them you might think sunlight i mean that's free that's available to everyone right uh just like the air we breathe like you uh, the sunlight is something that is just given to all equally. Well, no, not in the world of plants, where you are not a being that possesses any form of locomotion. You're rooted in one place, quite literally, with your roots. And so in a place like the Brazilian rainforest, where because of the conditions, life can be so fecund, eventually the real estate becomes rather expensive. And how do the plants settle this? Do they, do, do they make a decision to share all the sunlight equally? No, they have a struggle for which forms of life are going to get the most sunlight to the detriment of the others. Now, of course, the plants that exist in the lower parts of the rainforest have to adapt to uh, the, the lack of that resource, right? So it's not as if they all just die automatically, but they, even that adaptation was something that untold millions of organisms did have to die in, in order to bring that forward, right? Um, that was an enhancement maybe of the type plant that had to be made uh, in certain species in order to compete. But one of the ways that that competition happens is with this vine, the Sipo matador, that scales, it climbs up these tall, tall trees in the rainforest. And what happens is sort of these arms shoot around each side. So imagine the vine is growing upward and then horizontally vines creep around sort of hugging the tree and they meet each other and they connect and as it grows it begins to harden and then it begins to tighten and what happens is as the vine reaches the top and crests over the canopy in order to get some of that delicious sunlight it unfurls its crown these flowers then spread their seed into the wind and then by this time, it has suffocated and basically strangled the uh, beautiful, tall, towering tree to death. And then both organisms die. Similarly to, you know, it's, you might say, well, that's terrible for the vine. Well, it, all it cares about is probably it doesn't uh, have a self-preservative will, right? It has a will to power. It wants to spread its seed. It wants to um, give rise to something beyond itself. And so... Why does Nietzsche bring this up? Well, he brings up the Sipo Matador in order to describe, it's one example of what life is in his view and how life operates. And, you know, we look at such a thing and we're like, 
you know, I've described the Sipo Matador to a few people in my personal life, and they all have the same reaction. They're morally angry at this plant for being a parasite, <laughs> which I mean, I, I'm not even going to explain why that's so ridiculous because we should all know, right? But it's funny. They, they, they have this reaction because, um, I don't know. We, we have moral ideas against freeloaders and people who take advantage of others and exploit them and, and, um, steal from them, right? Which is what you could see the plant doing. Funnily enough, that is actually also based on the idea of like an order of rank, a hierarchical order of rank, right? That vine should just be be a good little vine and not attack that beautiful tall tree who is clearly should be the nobility in this situation, right? But actually Nietzsche uses the Sipo Matador as a metaphor for the aristocracy. And so I'll read just one little section of 258 where he says, quote, their fundamental faith simply has to be that society must not exist for society's sake, but only as the foundation and scaffolding on which a choice type of being is able to raise itself to its higher task and to a higher state of being, end quote. And that is where he then makes the comparison to the Sipo Matador, that society, um, all of us really, are only... Um, here for the instrumental use of a higher type of being. And again, in the political sense, it's all very uncomfortable until we recognize the presence of this type of thinking within our own reasoning, and it pops up all the time. And I've brought this up before to get this across, but I want, I'll use it again because I think it's particularly forceful. You may have heard the turn of phrase, in favor of the idea that we should more equitably distribute wealth in society and have a social safety net and take care of people, how many lost Einsteins are there toiling away in the lower classes, right? The idea that talent could appear anywhere, genius could appear at any stratum of society. And if such a genius didn't have the resources available to them to manifest their genius, they could end up toiling away as a you know, a plant worker or maybe a Starbucks barista somewhere. And wouldn't that just be horrible if Einstein was forced to, what, do the job that millions of people rely on in order to survive and feed themselves? Right? And, oh, well, there it is. A light bulb goes off. We believe that someone who has genius, who has something to offer the world, some gift of beauty or intellect or um, some sort of great uh, technological or scientific power that they could give to all of us should not be um, forced to be a laborer. That and what, but what does that mean, right? I mean, we have division of labor in civilization. One could say division of labor is the premise of civilization. Well, division of labor is based on the ideas of order of rank and the pathos of distance. Because if Einstein isn't out there laboring for his supper, that means that somebody else is. We're paying him for his mind, right? Um, and it doesn't have to be Einstein. It, I'm just using Einstein because that's the easiest example, right? But we all tend to have that moral prejudice that a true genius shouldn't have to labor. And we leave out that second part of the equation that other people should have to labor for them in order to support their existence. And, you know, we, we might say that, they're, well, their labor is more valuable. The labor of the mind that they're doing is more valuable. Well, that is, you're thinking along the lines that approximate what Nietzsche is saying here. The, the other aspects of this passage are Nietzsche suggesting, um, that uh, corruption and a threatening anarchy among the instincts, which, so again, this like this drive to abolish all hierarchy, no gods, no masters, which is first and foremost a physiological, instinctual thing. It's a symptom of late society. Um, he says is basically it's a symptom of the declining strength of the organism is really his point that in during the French Revolution, the Anshan regime had already surrendered its noble privileges step by step. They had already lost the faith in the fact that they were the raison d'etre for society to exist. And once that happens, it's sort of inevitable that this 
uh, this corruption, this disbelief in their legitimacy will set in. And in a way that is simply a physiological process. That's just what naturally happens within the course of a civil, uh, of a society or civilization, um, just playing out the way that it always does. But if you want a more complete analysis of this aphorism, you can uh, look up that episode. We'll go to 259, quote, Refraining mutually from injury, violence, and exploitation, and placing one's will on a par with that of someone else, this may become, in a certain rough sense, good manners among individuals, if the appropriate conditions are present. Namely, if these men are actually similar in strength and value standards, and belong together in one body. But as soon as this principle is extended, and possibly even accepted as the fundamental principle of society, it immediately proves to be what it really is, a will to the denial of life, a principle of disintegration and decay. End quote. So one of the points that Nietzsche makes way back in Human All Too Human, when he's analyzing the Melian dialogue between the Athenian ambassador and the Melians, and he's using this as a sort of a point to attack the idea of the social contract theory. Nietzsche's suggestion is that the idea of justice or equality arises between parties of roughly equal strength because these notions in the ancient world are premised on the idea that if we get into an altercation, we might both be harmed, or I'm not sure if I could actually destroy or dominate you. And so, therefore, we have to have some sort of, uh, we have to come to some sort of agreement or understanding for the benefit of both parties. When there is an imbalance in power, as Nietzsche says, the terrifying Melian dialogue reminds us, the ideas of justice and equality of rights become quite laughable. And that's what's so shocking about the Melian dialogue is how honest the Athenians are about all of this. And it really does make you, uh, you know, when, when you have so much moralizing from modern day empires as they carry out their exploitative, dominating, uh, you know, terrible deeds, all while moralizing about how they're doing the right thing and respecting human rights uh, worldwide and so on and so forth, trying to bring human rights and democracy and freedom around the world. It really does make you yearn for the more honest style of imperialism of the um, Athenians, but Nietzsche says here, when you make that into the fundamental principle of society, it proves to be what it really is. So that implies that that's, it's a, he says it's a denial of life and a principle of disintegration and decay, which implies that it was always that, that the extent to which we forget that nature is this war of all against all and believe that we belong together in one body when we equate unequal things because no matter how similar we might be in strength or in our values or in our viewpoint or our perspective our way of life and so on and so forth that ultimately the individual is its own locus of power which is that your experience of power is not someone else's experience of power your happiness is not someone else's happiness no one else can feel your happiness for you so to speak, right? That there is a sort of irreducible individuality or difference between beings. That Whenever we class things together, we're always equating unequal things. And the reason for making that initial equation, that initial judgment of reconciliation and unity in favor of competition might have been advantageous at a given time or a given place. But when it becomes a rule, it is anti-life, inherently. Okay, so we'll, we'll continue. Quote, Here we must beware of superficiality and get to the bottom of the matter, resisting all sentimental weakness. Life itself is essentially appropriation, injury, overpowering of what is alien and weaker, suppression, hardness, imposition of one's own forms, incorporation, and at least, at its mildest, exploitation. But why should one always use those words in which a slanderous intent has been imprinted for ages? Even the body within which individuals treat each other as equals, as suggested before, and this happens in every healthy aristocracy, if it is a living and not a dying body, 
has to do to other bodies what the individuals within it refrain from doing to each other. It will have to be an incarnate will to power. It will strive to grow, spread, seize, become predominant, not from any morality or immorality, but because it is living and because life simply is will to power. But there is no point on which the ordinary consciousness of Europeans resists instruction as on this. Everywhere people are now raving, even under scientific disguises, about coming conditions of society in which the exploitative aspect will be removed, which sounds to me as if they promise to invent a way of life that would dispense with all organic functions. Exploitation does not belong to a corrupt or imperfect and primitive society. It belongs to the essence of what lives as a basic organic function. It is a consequence of the will to power, which is, after all, the will of life. If this should be an innovation as a theory, as a reality, it is the primordial fact of all history. People ought to be honest with themselves at least that far. End quote. And so uh, many of the things that I was trying to get across about Nietzsche's broader thought, he puts very succinctly here. Um, I, in a way, I was just sort of foreshadowing <laughs> this very aphorism with some of my earlier commentary, but it, life is will to power and life is essentially appropriation, injury, overpowering, suppression, hardness, imposition, incorporation at its mildest exploitation. And therefore, it's not the problem is not that early society was like crude and barbaric and exploitative. It is the essence of what lives as a basic organic function. Now, the word essence and the, the very idea of life having an essence and that essence being will to power, something I take issue with and something I try to avoid when explaining Nietzsche because I think it's so, so important to avoid that sort of, frankly, platonic construction. But I think Nietzsche is aware of this. And I think if, if the word essence was ever warranted in his work, it is here. And it is on this point that you could probably have some of the best uh, opportunities for attacking Nietzsche's ideology. Because you could argue, just as an, a counterexample, that life has a nurturing aspect. And that uh, living things have a great love for, you know, those, for their offspring and other things that are of the same kind as them. Which, you know, is, is the herd not part of life? Right? There are plenty of forms of life that seem to do quite well with that uh, type of you know, structure for their society. So can we really say will to power is the essence? Maybe we have to complicate our picture of life, or maybe we would have to define will to power in such a way in which that is included, which I think Nietzsche does in, in other places. But then that means if will to power could include something like loving and bringing up your offspring, um, it's hard to say that the, the essence of that is violence and exploitation, um, at least not in a healthy family <laughs> structure, right? And um, I don't think Nietzsche would say that either. And I think in passages like this, it, it is useful to consider that Nietzsche is, he's trying to hammer and smash through all of our mental blocks for not confronting these basic facts about the brutal nature of life. And I think he is right that we still look away from this today. Um, it's not just the co ordinary consciousness of Europeans in the 19th century. I think it is uh, very much a, a almost universal problem that the more that we are removed from the state of nature, the more that we create ideas that wish to deny what that state of nature is and imagine that we are separate from it. And as Nietzsche says, um, it's as if they promised to invent a way of life that would dispense with all organic functions. To say that life is good is to say that predation is good, parasitism is good. Those are all aspects of life. And while I have raised you know, a ob potential objection that there are other aspects to life, I think it is very hard to get away from that inherent element of you know, again, thinking of the struggle of the Brazilian rainforest for light, that this struggle is always there and everything that comes along with that. And that struggle is even going on within you on like a microcellular level. And so with that, I think we can move on to the following section, which is 260. And 
again, I'm not going to read this whole section because if you go all the way back to season one, the episode on the master and slave morality, which I believe is episode 10, we discuss this entire aphorism in detail with a couple others on the same topic. But this is where Nietzsche outlines, for the first time since Human All to Human, this notion of the master and slave morality. I think it's the first time he designates the, them by these names. And just the bullet points is that Nietzsche sketches out the idea that he would later elaborate on in Genealogy of Morality. There are actually two origins of all of our modern moral ideas, that the master in morality was, came from a ruling class that determined for itself what was good, so they were active, they were affirmative, they said this is good, and then what was bad was sort of an afterthought. They saw the authority within themselves to declare what was good, what they idealized. Of course, they saw it in themselves, right? Often finding the uh, arrogance, we might say, uh, from our modern perspective, to designate themselves as the ideal type of human being. But they felt that they had that right because they were the kind of people who experienced their own power in the world in a physical, externalized sense. And Nietzsche um, explains in this passage that what good meant in many of these languages meant approximately the same thing as noble, as the, the higher class in, within society, the aristocrats. And he gives etymological evidence for this in Genealogy of Morality, that the word for good meant us, we're the good people. And everything bad was just sort of like those other people there Nietzsche says you could say the word bad could translate to contemptible, but roughly speaking, the people who are beneath me. The main reversal in the slave morality is that the slave morality begins from a position of fear, fear of what is harmful, and that it's the kind of morality that comes from a position of weakness. So morality from the position of strength is self-affirmative, says, I am what I am, this is the ideal, this is my ideal, I'm going to instantiate my ideal and manifest that ideal. And everything that gets in my way, maybe, is bad. But even the enemy is not bad, as Nietzsche points out in the Greek morality, because the noble mindset, the person who is confident in their own strength, doesn't regard the enemy or the challenge that they come up against as evil, if anything that is somewhat helpful to you, or supremely helpful to have uh, another blade to sharpen yours against, if that makes sense. That's how the nature of Greek friendship was, was as something like between a, a friend and a rival, or a brother, but also an enemy. <laughs> but in any case, the, the uh, slave morality, which starts from a position of weakness, is entirely concerned with escaping from that which it fears and that which does harm. And so it begins from the negative position, the reactive position, from saying that is evil because it harms me and therefore the harmless man is what is good and of course nietzsche says that the the people of the slave morality are always uh, suspicious because they never fully believe that there's a truly harmless man that even he who appears to be harmless it could just be a veneer for um you know something evil beneath that outward facing appearance right and this is why, in Nietzsche's view, the nobility are the first proper cast of people, because they all sort of recognize each other's power and have this concept of equality between them based on that premise, versus the disaggregated mass, which is all afraid of one another. And it's not until the slave morality becomes apotheosized in the form of Christianity that we get the ultimate expression of the slave morality in Nietzsche's view, resist not evil, is uh, one of the ways of looking at it, that that's one of Christ's teachings, to turn the other cheek and to not even offer any resistance against the evil that is done to you, which maybe paradoxically or ironically might be the thing that actually allows people of the slave morality to like form a community together, to have this idea of equality under the eyes of God is maybe their their mutual uh, fear of one another can be alleviated by um, so many um, 
<laughs> so many taking this vow of, of harmlessness, essentially, right? Being able to have faith in the harmlessness of others is the, um, the success of the, the slave morality in the form of Christianity. And as Nietzsche points out, all modern, he says these uh, two types can exist within the same soul, and all of our modern morality is descended from both. And there are ways in which, I mean, Nietzsche would certainly say that the, the slave revolt in morality was Christianity overturning the master morality of the ancient Greeks and to some extent the Romans, and then traveling north and overtaking the Vikings who used to say that Wotan put a hard heart in my breast, right? Um, you know, uh, Christianity overtakes even there. But a large part, we have to understand that the master morality is still within us. We can still see aspects of it that we respect, um, you know, or we value things that come out of the uh, noble morality even today. Nietzsche talks about what some of those things are, and he even does so in a way that isn't to denigrate. But nevertheless, the idea of, for example, the Germans as a people who are descended from, you know, Teutonic pagans who might have had something approximating that master morality, but also being a deeply Christian people, I think un really understanding that inner conflict and that inner turmoil and the fact that Nietzsche th thinks the master and slave morality, therefore, exist in some measure in every heart, I think he certainly felt that as uh, somebody coming up in Germany and certainly as a, a pastor's son, um, and nevertheless a man who was then educated into the, uh, the knowledge of the ancient Greeks and what they valued and the way they looked at the world. Um, Nietzsche feels this opposition within himself, and he sees it in all of Germany, but I think you could then uh, he, 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 he certainly applies it to all of Europe, and I think we could apply it to pretty much all modern people today. Um, it's just that I do want to stress that I would, I would say that Nietzsche's overall position is that the slave morality predominates, and it's mostly the sort of moral language that we speak and the way that we understand what is right and wrong in modern language mostly comes out of the slave morality. But there are little ways in which the master morality emerges that it can't be um, it, it can't be completely excised because to the extent that we are alive we're going to have some sense for this active self-legislating morality and that this doesn't you know Nietzsche's just spent all this time talking about like cruelty and exploitation he does point out in this passage uh, what does he say against beings of a lower rank against everything alien one may behave as one pleases, or as the heart desires, and in any case be on good and evil. Here, pity and like feelings may find their place. So, uh, end quote, it's not inherently like slavish to show compassion or to be merciful or generous, that these are still traits that the people in noble societies might have praised. It's simply that they do not have, they don't have a sense of duty for not behaving in a manner that is pitying. They simply act in accord with the desires of their own heart, as he puts it here. And we might remember that epigram that whatever is done out of love takes place necessarily beyond good and evil. And I think it's important to keep that aphorism in mind, not because it says something about love, but because it says something about what it means to act in a manner which is beyond good and evil, which Nietzsche is somewhat correlating with that noble orientation towards life here. Uh, remember what he says earlier in this chapter about the nobility being, um, or sorry, constantly practicing obedience and command. And uh, if we will remember, this is a obedience and command. It has this aspect which might have to do with the will or the political dimension, but there is a very basic sense in which this is the essence of life as well, and therefore tied in with this idea of will to power. And again, the formula, stimulus and response. You, um, it's a, We might say it's a poetical way of putting things, but if you put your hand on the stove 
your body gives you the command, feel pain on your hand, and you obey instantly, right? There's no, you don't decide whether you feel that pain or not. You have to obey that commandment. Um, and so the stimulus and then the response, you have some sort of sense data coming in and then your reaction to it within your nervous system. And this is spontaneous, we might say automatic, uh, we might say something that is not conscious or deliberated. And that love is something of that type. To act as the heart desires is to be tyrannized over by a feeling. And however you react to that feeling, it is a, it's a form of physiological response. Nietzsche would say it is uh, amoral beyond good and evil. And that it's the, the introduction of these duties and moral duties and the idea that there is this um, intermediary of conscious deliberation that can interrupt the pure obedience and command of stimulus and response. Uh, that's one of these modern ideas. But anyway, as I said, I wanted to read the end of 260 here. We are just going to look at the very end where I think there are a couple interesting things that I just would like to comment on briefly. Quote, one last fundamental difference, uh, just to break in here really quick. Nietzsche, this is a fundamental difference between the master and slave morality. Uh, quote, the longing for freedom, the instinct for happiness, and the subtleties of the feeling of freedom belong just as necessarily to slave morality and morals as artful and enthusiastic reverence and devotion are the regular symptom of an aristocratic way of thinking and evaluating. This makes plain why love as passion, which is our European specialty, simply must be of noble origin. As is well known, its invention must be credited to the provincial knight poets, those magnificent and inventive human beings of the Guy Seber, to whom Europe owes so many things and almost owes itself. End quote. Guy Seber, of course, means the gay science. And those provincial knight poets, the troubadours, are those for whom the work the gay science is named. And Nietzsche thinks they were like a great example within the history of Europe as a sort of aristocratic, creative, affirmative mode of life. And I wanted to read those the, the ending there um, because Nietzsche brings out the longing for freedom, something we would generally, and I would say even a Nietzschean, could say is worth valuing. That's not an unqualified statement. As we know, in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche writes that many want to be free from, but that what really matters is being free for. What are you free for? Why do you want to be free of restrictions um, or of the past limitations that, that bound you in some way? For what purpose is the real question, right? But even with that in mind, we could say much of this book is about the pursuit of freedom from these, we might say, habitual approaches, um, habits of our thought toward thinking about morality metaphysics, and so on. And so I, I don't think Nietzsche is uh, down on freedom. I think Nietzsche is very much uh, pro-freedom, and I think he's also for reverence and devotion, enthusiastic reverence and devotion, which he says are the regular symptom of an aristocratic way of thinking and evaluating. So Nietzsche is giving us two admirable ways in which both of these moralities manifest in our own um, character today where when you see those character traits and that way of being, you're seeing an expression of something that first came into consciousness, um, emerged into the psyche as a result of this master and slave morality, as a result of these power relationships, right? Meaning as a result of this order of rank and pathos of distance and so on and so forth. And love as passion, again, love as feeling. This, uh, I think, helps to explain, again, or it ties it back to this idea of the aristocratic types as being enthusiastic and devoted, as being the types who wish to obey, funnily enough, which is why he writes in the book Zarathustra that line about he who wishes to command must learn to obey. I think 
it's easy to get sort of turned around by the language that Nietzsche uses there and pondering what it means. But I think, again, when you return to the idea of stimulus and response, it makes perfect sense that the noble style of living and evaluating doesn't insert this intermediary idealism between the stimulus and response, between the doer and the deed, between the cause and the effect, between who you are and what you do. Um, the That presupposition that there is such a neutral substratum, the ego, ego consciousness or the soul, is that is a superstitious belief in Nietzsche's view, and it only exists as a premise for the moralism of the slave morality. So that's why the the passionate nature of the aristocracy is often something Nietzsche emphasizes, but also he talks about them as creatures of duty and obligation. And I think when you understand it that way, that a feeling is a duty or an obligation and being a whole human being or a more complete human being or a more complete beast, as Nietzsche says elsewhere, is that unity of feeling and the sense of obligation where all of the duties that you carry out is exactly what you want to be doing. Your alignment of your values and your way of life is another way of putting it. And so uh, I think that more or less covers that, that passage and you can read the, or listen to the episode on the master and slave morality for more on that topic. We'll move on to 261 quote. Among the things that may be hardest to understand for a noble human being is vanity. He will be tempted to deny it, where another type of human being could not find it more palpable. The problem for him is to imagine people who seek to create a good opinion of themselves, which they do not have of themselves, and thus do not deserve, and who nevertheless end up believing this good opinion themselves. This strikes him half as such bad taste and lack of self-respect, and half as so baroquely irrational that he would like to consider vanity as exceptional, and in most cases, when it is spoken of, he doubts it. He will say, for example, I may be mistaken about my value and nevertheless demand that my value, exactly as I define it, should be acknowledged by others as well. But this is no vanity, but conceit, or more frequently what is called humility or modesty. Or, for many reasons, I may take pleasure in the good opinion of others, perhaps because I honor and love them, and all their pleasures give me pleasure, perhaps also because their good opinion confirms and strengthens my faith in my own good opinion, perhaps because the good opinion of others, even in cases where I do not share it, is still useful to me or promises to become so, but all that is not vanity. The noble human being must force himself at the aid of history to recognize that since time immemorial and all somehow dependent social strata, the common man was only what he was considered not at all used to positing values himself, he also attached no other value to himself than his masters attached to him. It is the characteristic right of masters to create values. It may be understood as the consequence of an immense atavism that even now the ordinary man still always waits for an opinion about himself and then instinctively submits to that, but by no means only a good opinion also a bad and unfair one. Consider, for example, the great majority of the self-estimates and self-underestimates that believing women accept from their father confessors and believing Christians quite generally from their church. End quote. So he begins talking about vanity there and talking about how the noble person might not even understand vanity. And we have to understand that he's using vanity in the sense to mean putting on airs a sort of vanity as mere appearance, an appearance that masks an inner content. And what he describes, the kind of vain person he describes, is something, or a type of person I, I would say that most of us have probably encountered, who is desperate to make others uh, sort of express their value to them because they don't actually believe it within themselves. Um, and so he's using this not to make a broader point about vanity, but as a, a hook to get into the moral mindset of the uh, noble or the master morality, as he's described it. 
that the major distinction or dichotomy to take away from this was that in the amongst the common strata of people, one's self-conception is based on the perceptions of others or their perception of how others perceive them, but that it is the right of the masters to create values um, and thus their estimation of their own value, their own self-image they see as coming entirely from within themselves. It's another thing that they self-legislate. It is something affirmative, active, creative, um, rather than reactive, passive, and based on like consensus and social relationships and so on. And this, we, Nietzsche has already sort of described this in the way that they craft their moral codes one which is based on a, re- a power relationship, the slave morality, and which is based on, uh, we would say, reactivity, and the master morality itself, which is based on activity, affirmation, and doesn't have to do with a relationship to the extent that there is an other or a bad or that which is alien or whatever we want to call it, that's not even an essential part of the master morality. <laughs> It's a, uh, a posture of indifference. But this relational nature of the, the mindset, which Nietzsche ties or correlates with Christianity here um, in the last part that we just read, that orients you entirely towards what do other people think of me? And that's where their self-conception comes from. It's received from the collective. So Nietzsche's not he's taken it by making it about vanity, right? And self-conception. He's taken it from the level of morality and is speaking more psychologically, just about uh, identity and self-conception. Okay, uh, we'll finish out the passage. Quote, In accordance with the slowly arising democratic order of things and its cause, the intermarriage of masters and slaves, the originally noble and rare urge to ascribe value to oneself on one's own and to think well of oneself will actually be encouraged and spread more and more now. But it is always opposed by an older, ampler, and more deeply ingrained propensity. And in the phenomenon of vanity, this older propensity masters the younger one. The vain person is delighted by every good opinion he hears of himself. Quite apart from all considerations of its utility and also apart from truth or falsehood just as every bad opinion of him pains him, for he submits to both. He feels subjected to them in accordance with that oldest instinct of submission that breaks out in him. It is the slave in the blood of the vain person, a residue of the slave's craftiness, and how much slave is still residual in woman, for example, that seeks to seduce him to good opinions about himself. It is also the slave who afterwards immediately prostrates himself before these opinions as if he had not called them forth. And to say it once more, vanity is an atavism, end quote. And so vanity is a throwback. It is a throwback to the conditions of the slave castes of ancient civilization. That's what he's saying there. That the, the democratic movement that intermarries the master and slave morality. Nietzsche says this will probably spread this... Um, noble, originally rare urge to ascribe value to oneself on one's own, this is going to spread more and more throughout society. That part of this democratic movement involves the spreading of master morality values throughout the populace, potentially, at least. But vanity, to the extent that it exists, is based on the conception of you in the minds of others. And the way he describes vanity here at the end, it is, you realize that, you know, whatever we want to call it, all of these sort of mental states and feelings of submitting to the good and value, good and bad opinions about you of others, regardless of their truth and falsehood, um, placing a high value on that, that is indelibly other directed. It is um, completely reactive and submissive. And so, um, this is also an element of Zen, by the way. It's one of the things that I found 
um, uh, that I enjoyed about Zen is that, uh, and that I still appreciate about it is that there was a great deal about freeing yourself from this sense of vanity as well. Um, and for, to, to speak with the vulgar, not giving a shit about what others think about you and realizing that to the extent that you, you are yielding to the opinions of others and giving that, that any sort of letting that take up any space in your, your psyche is a a waste. Uh, it's like, you know, the, the common saying, letting people live rent free in your head, right? Um, you know, they're taking up space (laughs) that could be used for other things. Um, but the key point here is the differentiating the those two orientations of the world, the the orientation of the person who feels themselves to be powerful in a position of power in the world versus the person who feels themselves to be in a position of weakness. The reason why it is important, though, that Nietzsche ends on the note of calling it an atavism is that it draws our attention back to the ways in which our moral ideas today might not necessarily correlate with our own position in society that we are in many ways still mouthing the words and acting out the ideals of 2000 years ago or more and thus that we might end up (laughs) our moral ideas might be completely mismatched with like who we are and just just pointing that fact out might help us to gain some distance on what our moral ideas are and maybe stop self-identifying with them and um, reifying them the way that we do. Okay, uh, let's move on to 262. Quote, A species comes to be, a type fixed and strong, through the long fight with essentially constant unfavorable conditions. Conversely, we know from the experience of breeders that species accorded superabundant nourishment and quite generally extra protection and care soon tend most strongly toward variations of the type and become rich in marvels and monstrosities, including monstrous vices. End quote. So uh, I would just call back to mind Nietzsche's note in Will to Power that to those human beings that are of any concern to him, he wants hardship, desolation, danger, so on and so forth, because... That which does not kill me makes me stronger. That old adage from the military school of life. Um, If we actually take that principle seriously, that um, facing challenge, facing hardship, facing pain and suffering is not in and of itself detrimental to life, but in fact could aid the flourishing of life. And that in fact, if we look at the whole history of evolution on this planet, that does seem to be the case that the stronger the uh, evolutionary pressures, the more um, vital the organisms, right? The more um, they're able to sustain themselves and maintain uh, their form, their pattern of being against uh, external pressures, the more they're exposed to those pressures. Whereas when you remove them, those uh, it, you atrophy, in so many words, but, and actually what Nietzsche says, they become rich in marvels and in monstrosities. Again, that there's a lot to be said about the ways in which you can analogize from the microcosm to the macrocosm with what Nietzsche is saying, that what he's saying when he's talking about like the decay of society or the corruption of society as a physiological event, this is one of the things that he means that they become rich in these marvels and monstrosities right? Um, that all sorts of types, uh, you might say ways of being for human beings might come into being, which would be unthinkable on the step or trying to survive in the savannah as, you know, uh, a, a newly minted, uh, homo sapiens, you know, in the, uh, paleolithic age, there are ways of life that just aren't even imaginable. Nevertheless, we would say, that all of those ways of life, which might occur in the later stages of uh, civilization, for example, um, they might be beautiful, magnificent experiments in living, but that everything tried and tested on the battlefield of nature is what makes up what we are now. Like all of our 
strength, vitality, or whatever you would say, everything that's adaptable about human beings. Um, <laughs> everything that we are was created on that, that battlefield of nature. And so we'll finish uh, or continue this passage. Quote, Now look for once at an aristocratic commonwealth, say an ancient Greek polis or Venice, as an arrangement, whether voluntary or involuntary, for breeding. Human beings are together there who are dependent on themselves and want their species to prevail, most often because they have to prevail or run the terrible risk of being exterminated. Here that boon, that access, and that protection which favor variations are lacking. The species needs itself as a species, as something that can prevail and make itself durable by virtue of its very hardness, uniformity, and simplicity of form, and a constant fight with its neighbors or with the oppressed who are rebellious or threaten rebellion. Manyfold experience teaches them, to which qualities, above all, they owe the fact that despite all gods and men, they are still there, that they have always triumphed. These qualities they call virtues. These virtues alone they cultivate. They do this with hardness. Indeed, they want hardness. Every aristocratic morality is intolerant. In the education of youth, in their arrangements for women, in their marriage customs, in the relations of old and young, in their penal laws, which take into account deviance only, they consider intolerance itself a virtue, calling it justice. In this way, a type with few but very strong traits, a species of severe, warlike, prudently taciturn men, close-mouthed and closely linked, and as such possessed of the subtlest feeling for the charms and nuances of association, is fixed beyond the changing generations. The continual fight against ever-constant unfavorable conditions is, as mentioned previously, the cause that fixes and hardens a type. End quote. Um, I think a lot of that is very clear. I would just say, again, as a historical instantiation of this, I would look back to the episode we did on the Mukadima in last uh, season, Ibn Khaldun. Or, uh, for that matter, Machiavelli and his discourses on Livy. And, you know, Mach Machiavelli was an influence on Nietzsche, mainly um, insofar as both of these other sources hold that opinion. And Ibn Khaldun actually formulates it into this idea of asabia, which is we might call social capital, the ties that bind society together. And he talks about this like hardness, uniformity, all a constant fight with the neighbors, right? Um, with all these neighboring tribes, this is what characterizes the Bedouins. And they create this like ironclad discipline and virtue. And that's what allows them to conquer these more sedentary societies. Um, and then you basically, once you've established yourself as a sedentary society, you then fight another kind of long battle, but it's against your own sort of creeping weakness, right? Or immorality, or you could call it decadence, however you want to put it. Corruption, as Kaufman often translates it in this uh, uh, translation. And that when you're forced to uh, cultivate virtues because it's a matter of life or death, um, they become you become very disciplined in your virtues. When that pressure is taken off, uh, immediately that begins to atrophy. And over a number of generations, um, this is what Khaldun blames for the fall of these sedentary societies: is that they forget their virtues. In so many words, and so I bring this up because I think what Nietzsche is talking about on the sociological or sociopolitical level is actually accurate to a large extent, even though we don't like to believe in things like virtue or decadence anymore. There is something here um, that just, again, you can extrapolate from an understanding of life as will to power, evolution as this war of all against all, to this same idea that pressures make you tough, a lack of pressures Will make you soft. And as a final point, I think when Nietzsche is talking about breeding here, I think he really means that, and that there is an element of the biological in what he's talking about here. That I mean, it, it again, it's like one of those really uncomfortable things reading this because we don't like to think about politics this way today. But again, like let's just look at a descriptive truth has nothing to do with our opinions. 
whoever controls the polity, whoever holds political power, holds power over reproduction. And time and again throughout human history, I mean, what has happened when one nation or people conquers another, right? They enslave, uh, in many cases, the conquered people, and then they decide who breeds with who. That's, I mean, I'm kind of dancing around it because it's very ugly to talk about. But when we look again at the animal kingdom, we can understand the reasons for why that has happened in human history. That we're not any better than any of those other species of animals. Now, you know, Nietzsche's not necessarily talking about like conquest here and, and those that kind of like really extreme example. But when he's talking about, you know, um, he says every aristocratic morality is intolerant in the education of youth, arrangements for women, marriage customs, relations of old and young. Um, this, there's a point here about, I mean, I guess you could just look at it like this, that again, to go back to that worn out example I've used a million times of the Spartans leaving their, um, you know, malformed or weak infants to die of exposure or starvation. Because in that world, the archaic Greece polis locked in constant war with one another, each of whom would love to wipe out the others and enslave their population. The worst thing that could happen to you, existential threat constantly. Your only option is to cultivate the toughest types of human beings you possibly can. And to do this, um, all of these ancient empires, city-states, nations, and peoples um, had these rules and restrictions that were with the intention of breeding, with reproduction. Out of the belief, or we might even say the knowledge, that if they didn't do it themselves, they were going to be conquered and other people would take control over that, right? Right. And you're going to then be bred to be slaves. Now, um, you know, we could easily question Nietzsche's premises here in terms of like the Lamarckian ideas as to whether or not, like, do you have to marry two warriors together in order to get a son who's a warrior, right? Um, or could people with different talents come from any strata of society? Again, as, as a modern person with a a healthy dose of a lot of this modern perspective myself, I would tend to believe that. But then, you know, you do look at examples like, uh, you know, like Yao Ming, famous Chinese basketball player. I mean, from what I understand, he was more or less eugenically produced within as a program of the Chinese to breed really tall people together to create this really tall kid. Maybe a way of, uh, I guess, setting this very controversial topic aside would be simply to say, there does seem to be like both a nature and a nurture element to what kind of people, uh, you know, we become that, you know, we can't completely rule out biology or enculturation and education. And with the field of epigenetics and more truths that we understand now about human beings, it might be that you could inherit certain character traits that might be turned on in a given set of circumstances. I think really the key takeaway, though, for grasping what Nietzsche is saying in this passage, really just is as simple as saying that um, selection pressures make you tough and their, their absence makes you weak. And, you know, on a factual scientific basis, how far could we take that when it comes to like biology versus enculturation and which is more important? That's something you could debate maybe outside of the text. Because again, that gets into differences of interpretation or opinion or like advances in science or technology. Really, the issue is uh, one of values, which that's what Nietzsche is asking us to confront. And we might think of that passage from, I believe it is, it's in the gay science, where, you know, a couple takes like a misshapen or uh, like a child with a birth defect to the local priest who tells them to kill it and everyone calls the priest cruel and he says isn't it crueler to let it live that is nietzsche in the form of a parable 
setting to clashing moral orientations against one another. The cruel thing is to kill it versus the cruel thing is to let it live. And so we'll continue with the passage quote. Eventually, however, a day arrives when conditions become more fortunate and the tremendous tension decreases. Perhaps there are no longer any enemies among one's neighbors and the means of life, even for the enjoyment of life, are super abundant. At one stroke, the bond and constraint of the old discipline are torn. It no longer seems necessary, a condition of existence. If it persisted, it would only be a form of luxury, an archa archaizing taste. Excuse me. Variation whether as deviation, something higher, subtler, rarer, or as degeneration and monstrosity, suddenly appears on the scene in the greatest abundance and magnificence, the individual dares to be individual and different. At these turning points of history, we behold, beside one another, and often mutually involved and entangled, a splendid, manifold, jungle-like growth and upward striving, a kind of tropical tempo in the comp competition to grow, and a tremendous ruin and self-ruination, as the savage egoisms that have turned almost exploded against one another wrestle for sun and light and can no longer derive any limit, restraint, or consideration from their previous morality. It was this morality itself that dammed up such enormous strength and bent the bow in such a threatening manner. Now it is outlived. The dangerous and uncanny point has been reached where the greater, more manifold, more comprehensive life transcends and lives beyond the old morality. The individual appears, obliged to give himself laws and to develop his own arts and wiles for self-preservation, self-enhancement, self-redemption. All sorts of new what-fors and wherewithals. No shared formulas any longer. Misunderstanding allied with disrespect. Decay, corruption, and the highest desires gruesomely entangled. The genius of the race overflowing from all cornucopias of good and bad. A calamitous simultaneity of spring and fall full of new charms and veils that characterize young, still unexhausted, still unwearied corruption. Again, danger is there, the mother of morals, great danger, this time transposed into the individual, into the neighbor and friend, into the alley, into one's own child, into one's own heart, into the most personal and secret recesses of wish and will. What may the moral philosophers emerging in this age have to preach now? These acute observers and loiterers discover that the end is approaching fast, that everything around them is corrupted and corrupts, that nothing will stand the day after tomorrow except one type of man, the incurably mediocre. The mediocre alone have a chance of continuing their type and propagating. They are the men of the future, the only survivors. Be like them, become mediocre, is now the only morality that still makes sense, that still gets a hearing. But this morality of mediocrity is hard to preach. After all, it may never admit what it is and what it wants. It must speak of measure and dignity and duty and neighbor love. It will find it difficult to conceal its irony. End quote. So, um, the bending of the bow. I want to talk about that metaphor first because it comes from the very preface that it was morality that bent the bow in such a threatening manner. So remember, the great tension of the spirit that Nietzsche talks about in the preface, created by what? Platonism. What is Christianity? It's Platonism for the people. What is democracy, utilitarianism, all the secular modern ideas? It is a, well, a secularization of Christianity. And so um, that moral metaphysical uh, thread which was an, a great error, as Nietzsche says in that preface, has persisted throughout our thought throughout all this time. And, but that tension that is created, this tension within the bow of the soul, this dangerous tension, we shouldn't be ungrateful to it because that allows us to shoot far to new goals, right? That was the metaphor. So yet again, it was this morality itself that damned up, damned up such enormous strength. And what he's talking about here is that morality of civilization, that morality of regarding others as equals, refraining from exploitation, domination, uh, destruction of those around you in favor of this unity. Well, that unity is forged within that warlike state, within the state of nature. Uh, after you successfully extricate yourself from it, you begin to break into, you know, to dissolve once again. And notice what he says sort of reemerges, a 
tropical tempo in the competition to grow, a jungle-like growth and upward striving. Um, savage egoisms wrestle with one another for sun and light. So he's using the exact same lang language that he was talking about when bringing up the Sipo Matador and using that as an example. He's saying it's a return to that primordial Bella Omnium Contra Omnis, war of all against all. It was simply that the iron clamp of the state for a short while basically was able to save up that energy. And then the energy was then expended as the civilization dies out. And this is another reason why people misunderstand Nietzsche's views on decadence, why decadence isn't quote unquote bad. He says it's a cornucopia of uh, every all the society's good and bad. It's the highest uh, desires and corruption gruesomely entangled. A uh, simultaneity of spring and fall. So new growth and the decay of the old. It's this explosion of all these possibilities out of the decay of the old. And as he said in other passages, that's where you get the great harvest of culture. It's not only the most productive times of you know art and science and literature, but it's the greatest people who have ever lived come during this time. And those are the ones who then sow the seeds of new um, social orders or new um, projects in civilization. And, uh, but what is the only, you know, the, <laughs> of course, uh, the greatest types of individuals are the ones who throw themselves into danger, who don't have that self-preservative instinct, right? Because there's something about will to power fully realized that's almost against the self-preservative instinct. Um, they, you know, they live by the, the words of that Neil Young song, it's better to burn out than to fade away. Um, so who is left after they burn out? Well, it's always the mediocre type of person. And this is the sense in which the last man recurs eternally. Again, to use the language of thus spoke Zarathustra. And what Nietzsche means by this, the mediocre alone have a chance of continuing their type and propagating, is that... <laughs> In Nietzsche's view, it is the on the level of the nobles or the aristocracy that culture really is created. That you had like a uniqueness or peculiarity, um, and you know it just sort of becomes like a bunch of like dead rote just rules of etiquette by the end. But that all of the um, the pomp and the uh, attire and the rituals and duties and obligations of all of these sort of like noble uh, classes or whatever we want to call them, um, you know, those, those were their distinct way of being in the world that was sort of like bound them together and represented some like unique, distinct way of life. And that that's what dies off with like the end of like a civilization or a society and that the individual people, um, you know, the, the, the farming stock of, one feudal kingdom in Europe doesn't really differ that much, whether they're Spanish or French or Italian, would sort of be Nietzsche's point. Now, is he right about that? I, I personally don't think so at all. I think the the folk ways of various peoples are actually can be very different and peculiar to one another. Um, but maybe he's right in the sense of, again, returning to the idea of the master versus slave morality all of the various powerful groups of people were the ones who asserted, created, uh, were active in creating their values. And so you get these um, distinct sets of ideals that are sort of just created out of them, right? I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining this, but I guess you, you can see the collective morality or the herd morality anywhere you go. The This concern with being perceived as a good person in the eyes of others and the herdish values of being as harmless as possible and uh, submitting as fully as possible to the dictates of conscience, which are sort of beaten into you by the collective, that this is something that um, you will find in any corner of the globe. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, again, whether Nietzsche's right or wrong about it, I think there's more complications than that. I think this passage is very helpful for understanding what he means by the last man, why, why he is the last man. He's literally the last man standing, right? This mediocre type that always persists. Um, now I think there is 
another idea in Nietzsche that is sort of contradictory to that, but that um, you could say the overman idea represents the hope that those exceptional types of people, sort of like the mutation in a genome, will actually elevate the whole species of mankind. Um, having faith in that idea that um, the mediocre don't have to remain mediocre, or that what's mediocre, uh, you know, yesterday could be, um, or what was exceptional yesterday could be commonplace tomorrow, something like that. I don't know. Again, a lot of the, that sort of difference in interpretation or opinion or in the prescriptive ideology that you're going to come out of, um, af- come out of this book with after reading Nietzsche is an argument you can fight out within yourself <laughs> that has more to do with you than it has to do with Nietzsche. Oh, and uh, as a final note, I mean, he uses, a, again, a repetition of phrases from earlier in the book when he remember he's talking about danger in the alley and in the heart sort of at the end of uh, chapter two i believe and here he says again a danger is uh, the danger is there the mother of morals so morality is what a tyrannical impulse morality is another tool of the will to power we might say it's kind of clumsy phraseology and again i'm just constantly reminded as i try to talk about and interpret this book how um like metaphysical and platonic are very languages for communicating things. And so I I try not to use language that could mislead you or create the wrong image in your head. But the very fact that our words are creating images in our heads and that like just our whole, the whole way that conceptual thought works, it's like swimming upstream sometimes with trying to get Nietzsche's ideas across, but danger, the mother of morals, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, is another common turn of phrase, but that, as he, as he says earlier in this passage, earlier in this aphorism, it is that danger that like binds a group together and forces them to cultivate things like virtue or discipline, and those morals that then become imposed upon society, that become uh, treated as if they were divinely handed down, um, you know, just revealed truths to mankind were actually ideals that people had to forge out of necessity in order to survive and that will to power is the we could say the father of morals maybe (laughs) um but you know what i'm trying to get across is that it's another manifestation of will to power um but danger in the alley and in the heart that's what emerges during this late stage of uh this explosion of activity, this cornucopia of all good and bad. Well, danger in the alley and in the heart is what Nietzsche earlier in the book um, said we philosophers and free spirits need in order to realize our potential, so to speak. So again, the idea that during this very age of corruption, which maybe a a conservative type philosopher might become apoplectic about, (laughs) Nietzsche sees the opportunity in. He sees this as the necessary um, stage in the creation of something new. And that's what sets him apart from all these other modes of thought, politically or just in, in general. All right, we'll move on to 263. Quote, There is an instinct for rank, which, more than anything else, is a sign of a high rank. There is a delight in the nuances of reverence that allows us to infer noble origin and habits. The refinement, graciousness, and height of a soul is tested dangerously when something of the first rank passes by without being as yet protected by the shutters of authority against obtrusive efforts and ineptitudes, something that goes its way unmarked, undiscovered, tempting, perhaps capriciously concealed and disguised like a living touchstone. Anyone to whose task and practice it belongs to search out souls will employ this very art in many forms in order to determine the ultimate value of of a soul and the unalterable innate order of rank to which it belongs. He will test it for its instinct of reverence. Difference in gendre hein. Uh, pardon my French, difference engenders hatred. The baseness of some people suddenly spurts up like dirty water when some holy vessel, some precious thing from a locked shrine, some book with the marks of a great destiny is carried past. 
And on the other hand, there is a reflex of silence, a hesitation of the eye, a cessation of all gestures that express how a soul feels the proximity of the most venerable. The way in which reverence for the Bible has on the whole been maintained so far in Europe is perhaps the best bit of discipline and refinement of manners that Europe owes to Christianity. Such books of profundity and ultimate significance require some external tyranny of authority for their protection in order to gain those millennia of persistence which are necessary to exhaust them and figure them out. Much is gained once the feeling has finally been cultivated in the masses, among the shallow and in the high-speed intestines of every kind, that they are not to touch everything, that there are holy experiences before which they have to take off their shoes and keep away their unclean hands. This is almost their greatest advance toward humanity. Conversely, perhaps there is nothing about so-called educated people and believers in modern ideas that is as nauseous as their lack of modesty and the comfortable insolence of their eyes and hands with which they touch, lick, and finger everything. And it is possible that even among the common people, among the less educated, especially among peasants, one finds today more relative nobility of taste and tactful reverence than among the newspaper-reading demimonde of the spirit, the educated. End quote. Um, I think this is a wonderful example of something Kaufman, um, a, a technique that Kaufman has described that Nietzsche uses often, where there is a reversal of expectations and where the passage is, is going. Um, oftentimes a sort of about face in the middle where Nietzsche has gotten us to look at things from one perspective and then um, offers a sort of sharp reversal from the other, the opposite vantage point, we might say. Um, or in this case here, sometimes he has that quick turnaround throwing you for a loop right at the end of the passage where in this whole chapter, which is a an assertion of the value of the order of rank and a positive presentation of the aristocracy, or at least the claim that aristocracy is natural. And yet, here at the end of this passage, which begins with the observation that the very instinct for rank is re revealing that someone is of a higher rank, Nietzsche says that there is among peasants, more relative nobility of taste and tactful reverence. And so understand, you know, even though he has that uh, passage about breeding, which has this element that might lead you to think that Nietzsche would favor an aristocracy of blood or something like that. But here, this sounds very much like the idea of the aristocracy of the spirit, sort of lends itself to the kind of interpretation of Nietzsche that's been put forward by Kaufman, or we might think of Nietzsche's uh, friend Meta von Salis and her idea that um, you know there were aristocrats of the spirit that could occupy any rank in society. We might also think of a later figure, uh, Gilles Deleuze, and um, you know throughout this passage or this chapter, I've sort of had Deleuze in the back of my mind and how he interprets what nobility means. Uh, and how it has nothing to do with any sort of actually politically instantiated aristocracy. It all has to do with uh, being active, being value-creating. Um, that's the short version, obviously. Once we get into Deleuze next season, it gets far more complicated than that. But uh, simply following from the principles that we've outlined throughout this chapter which include describing this noble sort of character or this noble sort of spirit, the, the essence of what it means to be noble, as characterized by this ability for obedience, for discipline, for being, being able to tame one's own will, so to speak. And so the instruction that the religion of Christianity and the Catholic Church and the reverence for the Bible, the sort of moral instruction that that offered Europe was to, that Nietzsche says was perhaps the most valuable thing that Christianity gave to Europe, was the discipline that it offered, the moral discipline, which we can see the pathos of distance is there, right? There's a pathos of distance when it comes to holy or sacred things. And that's the most... <laughs> outrageous or ridiculous or um, just the terrible part of like the, the new atheist type of person 
you know, here he says the educated people, believers in modern ideas, but the kind of person who has holds nothing to be truly sacred, right? Where because that magical enchantment of the world offered by Christianity has been stripped away by the scientific project, they gain a certain, um, I don't know what, joy or, or sense of liberation in saying, yes, truly, we embrace no gods, no masters, and uh, being irreverent, right? There is a certain modern irreverence that we can certainly see in our own culture today, and it's all throughout our humor and the the way in which so many of the popular characters uh, of you know recent decades are witty and ironic and cynical. And there are places in Nietzsche's work where he has positive words for cynicism, such as in Ecce Homo. But here he's pointing out what is their worst attribute, in his opinion. And it is that sort of immodesty and their failure to recognize that pathos of distance. And in his comments of, you know, having that instinct for rank as an, an indication of somebody having noble habits of the spirit, right? Well, that could occur, as Nietzsche suggests um, at the end of the passage, perhaps relatively speaking, but nonetheless in the lowest strata of society, in the peasant, right? It's, it has nothing to do with blood. And so the essential quality of the sentiments of the noble-minded person is this instinct for rank ordering, which means their understanding perhaps just on an instinctive level or physiological level of living beings as valuing beings, more so than any sort of general category, themselves as valuing beings, uh, valuing as consisting of rank ordering, and rank ordering as depending on this feeling for a necessary distance between things of different values or between sickness and health or between the mundane and the sacred. And this, the instinct for grasping these things is perhaps more developed in the places in society and the stratas of society where perhaps Nietzsche would allege they wouldn't have been found in yesteryear. That, you know, in, at the Academy of Athens, you would find far more noble-minded people amongst the educated. Um, now, maybe not after the time of Plato and when, after that, that mind virus got going, but, <laughs> you know, regardless of that, uh, even still, I think Nietzsche would, would hold that among that, uh, the educated of that time and place, you would find that's where the noble-minded people would largely um, be. Whereas, you know, in today's world, the educated, well, you can just go back to the chapter on scholars <laughs> for more about that. Uh, that if anything, they are among the most committed of, you know, the contemporary types of people at ignoring or looking away precisely from the hard truths that Nietzsche is attempting to lay out in this chapter. Let's go to 264. Quote, One cannot erase from the soul of a human being what his ancestors liked most to do and did most constantly, whether they were, for example, assiduous savers and appurtenances of a desk and cash box, modest and bourgeois in their desires, modest also in their virtues, or whether they lived accustomed to commanding from dawn to dusk, fond of rough amusements and also perhaps of even rougher duties and responsibilities, or whether finally at some point they sacrificed ancient prerogatives of birth and possessions in order to live entirely for their faith, their God, as men of an inexorable and delicate conscience, which blushes at every compromise. It is simply not possible that a human being should not have the qualities and preferences of his parents and ancestors in his body, whatever appearances may suggest to the contrary. This is the problem of race. End quote. And I'm going to uh, read Kaufman's comment on this passage. Quote, Here, as elsewhere, Nietzsche gives expression to his Lamarckian belief in the heredity of acquired characteristics shared by Samuel Butler and Bernard Shaw, but anathema to Nazi racists and almost universally rejected by geneticists. His Lamarckism is not just an odd fact about Nietzsche, but symptomatic of his conception of body and spirit. He ridiculed belief in pure spirit, but believed just as little in any pure body. 
He claimed neither could be understood without the other. For a detailed discussion, see Kaufman's Nietzsche, chapter 10. Uh, end quote. Um, as Kaufman points out, you, you can see the, the, the uh, I don't want to say desperation, but sort of the, the alacrity with which Kaufman is quick to defend Nietzsche. Um, because he's, as he's pointing out, Nietzsche is a Lamarckian, which is sort of like a dead school of thought. Um, so he is like a form of eugenicist, but as he's pointing out, like George Bernard Shaw in England, uh, also believes similar things to Nietzsche on this point. And it was actually a pretty common viewpoint in the 19th century. They believed a lot of, um, you know, things that we would consider pretty wild today, but, you know, uh, not only was there, um, I don't want to just like fall back on like they didn't have like the scientific knowledge. It, it was sort of like there were new scientific fields. They had a lot of scientific knowledge compared to like most of the rest of human history, right? But there were just new questions, like the whole concept of evolution by natural selection, even though you can find like precursors for it, is such a new idea. And if you don't, if you make that huge discovery, but you don't know anything else beyond sort of the initial premises, you that opens up like a huge wealth of possibilities, right? So maybe it is possible that beliefs and habits of thought and habits of even spending, as Nietzsche suggests in this paragraph, could be heritable. And again, as I mentioned, there are some new questions and complications, like in the field of epigenetics, that, you know, who knows where that'll go in the next couple of years. I guess I'm just saying, given where they were with like asking these questions, you can see why it might be like reasonable to ask the question if you're working off of 19th century science, if you're at that stage. Um, and Kaufman also points out that Nietzsche's style of eugenic thought is completely different from uh, the Nazis. His whole conception of race is completely different from theirs. Um, you know, the, the Nazis kind of entertained the, these theories that the races were like originally pure and therefore had a certain like essence or character to them. And then as they intermixed, like people got weak and degenerate or whatever. Whereas Nietzsche's view of like what a a race is or a people as he's outlined in it, it in this text, even though he does have like these Lamarckian ideas, it's far, far closer to the way we would conceive of like the origin of a quote unquote race or whatever you want to call that, that it's a, a people group that actually, assembles from multiple other people groups that are sort of like bound together by a certain environment and then a long period of isolation where they all live by the same way of life and, um, you know, come to value the same things, adopt a common culture and like intermarry for a long time. It's like a race is like a fluid thing, right? Where the boundaries of it are kind of blurry, but above all, it is a, you know, it's an aspect of living things. So it's a living, growing, changing thing. The idea of like purity of the race sort of doesn't make sense from that viewpoint. And so, um, you know, given all of his comments about like fatherlandishness and the desire to like meld together all the races in the previous chapter, I think it would be very clear that Nietzsche has very different ideas from the Nazis. But, you know, when that footnote was written by Kaufman, he's still defending Nietzsche from those sorts of accusations, which I think most people know better than that now. But I think that's just like worth reading because who knows, this might be this episode or, you know, I hope somebody isn't listening to this episode first, actually. <laughs> but, you know, it could happen. But if they're just f- for the first exposure to Nietzsche, just following along with this read through, I think it is worth saying, um, you know, citing Kaufman's words there. But we can see, again, how Nietzsche's ideas on this or why Lamarckism would be appealing to him because it kind of follows from his other philosophical ideas. So um, we'll finish out this passage. Quote, if one knows something about the parents, an inference about the child is permissible. Any disgusting incontinence, any nook envy, a clumsy insistence that one is always right. These three things together have always constituted the characteristic type of the plebeian. That sort of thing must as surely be transferred to the child as corrupted blood, and with the aid of the best education, one will at best deceive with regard to such heredity. Uh, okay, end quote. I just want to break in really here, uh, really quickly here. The previous passage, I was just saying, sort of like justified like a Delusian reading of Nietzsche, where what nobility means has nothing to do with breeding or whatever. Here he returns to that idea. So we can definitely see that 
it's not strictly one or the other. There's a reason why there's competing interpretations of what the important takeaway is from what Nietzsche is saying. But, I mean, I would just say he does give us in this um, little chunk that we just read, nook envy, a clumsy insistence, one is always right, and disgusting incontinence, which I don't think he means in the physical sense or physiological sense. He's uh, speaking in terms of um, the inability to control oneself in a disgusting manner, right? So, um, you know, being the kind of person who, you know, just says, puts their foot in their mouth all the time, blurts out um, things that maybe overshares or says things that might be unintentionally insulting. And, uh, you know, they have no self-awareness about this. They just say, oh, I'm just too honest, right? <laughs> they characterize it that way or something like that. And then we have uh, envying after the, um, you know, relative positions of others in society or that clumsy insistence that one is always right. So the, um, we might say, st stubbornness, pigheadedness. Um, more than that, we might say dogmatism or, you know, some sort of absolute commitment to... Um, hold to one's beliefs because they've become a sort of like identity for you. And, um, they just simply have to be right. Aside from Nietzsche's comments of the heritability of these traits, he says that this is the characteristic type of the plebeian. So in the same way where he was talking about the noble habits of the spirit as having to do with like reverence and a sense for like having some distance between, uh, the example Nietzsche uses, like the sacred and the um, the mundane or the the common, right? Uh, here he's describing that dogmatism, that inability to control oneself, and that sense of envy, resentment, um, as or you know, envy being a thing that can fuel resentment, as uh, characterizing what we might call like plebeianism of the soul. So. We'll finish out the passage. Quote, what else is the aim of education and culture today? And our very popularity minded, that is plebeian age, education and culture have to be essentially the art of deceiving about one's origins, the inherited plebs in one's body and soul. An educator who today preached truthfulness above all and constantly challenged his students, be true, be natural, do not pretend. Even such a virtuous and guileless ass would learn after a while to reach for that furca of Horace, to naturum expeller, with what success? Plebs usque recurret. Um, and the footnote references Horace's epistles, uh, 1, 10, 24. Try with a pitchfork to drive out nature. She always returns. End quote. So yet again, the idea of the popular education, or the education being fostered by the state and by the um, by society at large, is an act of looking away from the true um, reality of nature, deceiving ourselves uh, with all of these moral ideas about society. The educator as the high priest of this new um, outlook or orientation towards life, this new form of uh, sentimentality. Um, and in any case, just as a final point, the fact that he brings up enculturation and education at the end here shows that maybe Nietzsche's conception of what breeding means goes beyond just heritability of traits through strict, you know, descendants, biological descendants. Uh, 265, quote, at the risk of displeasing innocent ears, I propose, egoism belongs to the nature of a noble soul. I mean that unshakable faith that to a being such as we are, other beings must be subordinate by nature and have to sacrifice themselves. The noble soul accepts this fact of its egoism without any question mark, also without any feeling that it might contain hardness, constraint, or caprice, rather as something that may be founded in the primordial law of things. If it sought a name for this fact, it would say it is justice itself. Perhaps it admits under certain circumstances that at first make it hesitate that there are some who have rights equal to its own. As soon as this matter of rank is settled, it moves among these equals with their equal privileges, showing the same sureness of modesty and delicate reverence that characterize its relations with itself in accordance with an innate heavenly mechanism understood by all stars. It is merely another aspect of its egoism 
this refinement and self-limitation in its relations with its equals. Every star is such an egoist. It honors itself in them and in the rights it cedes to them. It does not doubt that the exchange of honors and rights is of the nature of all social relations and thus also belongs to the natural condition of things. The noble soul gives as it takes from that passionate and irritable instinct of repayment that lies in its depth. The concept grace has no meaning or good odor inter pares. There may be a sublime way of letting presents from above happen to one, as it were, and to drink them up thirst thirstily like drops, excuse me, but for this art and gesture the noble soul has no aptitude. Its egoism hinders it. Quite generally it does not like to look up, but either ahead, horizontally and slowly, or down. It knows itself to be at a height. End quote. And so, what Nietzsche describes here as the egoism of a noble soul should demonstrate why Nietzsche is different from somebody like Ayn Rand, who many people would say has like an egoistic style philosophy, which is all about the individual, right? The sovereignty of the individual. But Ayn Rand thinks it's immoral to like use other free beings for your own purposes. Um, whereas Nietzsche would say that the egoism of the noble soul says that's justice itself. And I guess I should qualify that Nietzsche doesn't necessarily say, and I too agree that this is the right thing. In some sense, though, he doesn't have to say it because if he is correct descriptively, well, then yet again, that if he's correct descriptively about the nature of what life is, as he outlined it earlier in the chapter, then like Ayn Rand's moral ideas about how you should treat others is nothing more than a fairy tale. And Nietzsche's description of this ability to legislate for oneself and say, this is the ideal that I'm imposing on the world, and I'm willing to sacrifice, or rather expend my own life force in the pursuit of it, and I'm even willing to expend the life force of others. I will use others to attain this goal because this ideal, this value is so important. And another aspect of this attitude or orientation toward the world is that um, passionate and irritable instinct of repayment. And so the way that the nobility recognize one another as beings of equal strength um, in Nietzsche's estimation is by their ability to requite, requite harm with harm and requite, uh, we might say, uh, loyalty to one, one's friends or loyalty of a subordinate with rewards. We might think of the traditions of gift giving that especially um, I think this occurred all over the ancient world, but especially I know one example in China that, uh, you know, if you are a visiting uh, nobleman from, you know, a, a foreign province or a visiting, you know, a king is visiting another king, um, it's customary that the one who is the host is supposed to, you know, give them a bunch of gifts, throw them a huge feast. Um, and the the degree to which you can sort of outspend the other person because they're expected to repay you in kind with as much generosity as they can muster when you come to their kingdom, right? So the the idea is that it's, you could look at it as a sort of competition, but both are sort of like overflowing with generosity to prove how wealthy and powerful they are. And if you've been given great generosity, you have to repay it. And it's it's not a moral duty, right? It's Nietzsche's saying that comes from a passionate instinct of repayment that lies within the noble soul, that they feel indebted to you when they've been shown you know, graciousness and generosity, and they simply have to repay it. It's not a Kantian duty, and they're not doing it out of a utilitarian calculation that you know, acting according to this rule will have a good outcome in the aggregate at some future time or something of that nature. Um, Yet again, much in this passage could apply on the level of one's character, and it might be found anywhere in anybody. We'll look at 266, which is very short. It's just a quote from Goethe to Rat Schlosser. Maybe it's pronounced Rat, um, but Nietzsche quotes Goethe, and that constitutes an aphorism, I guess. Uh, he says, quote, truly high respect one can have only for those who do not seek themselves, end quote. And that 
is somewhat of an enigmatic line unless we look at it in the broader context of the chapter. One who seeks themselves. And it's it's funny because in our, I would say, our culture of authenticity, as Muller would call it, the idea of seeking yourself, finding yourself, right? It's a very popular idea that people have talked about as a sort of like self-empowering thing. And a lot of people might loop Nietzsche's ideas into that, his idea of become who you are. But becoming who you are is very different from like, going and finding your true self that's been hidden from you. One is talking about changing and growing into what you were always destined to become. The other is about, um, you know, feeling a sense of alienation from what your self identity might be and having to like do introspection to find it and discover what you are. And so I think it's actually very simple because he says truly high respect can only have for the people who don't seek themselves. So truly high respect is for those who know who they are. And that's not to say that somebody who might be in the position of, you know, trying to find themselves today might not know very much or very well who they are tomorrow and might become such a person worthy of such respect. But, um, I think, (laughs) It's funny because it's like, it's almost the inverse of the idea of like, it's about the journey, not the destination. Goethe's sort of saying like, yeah, you go on your journey, but I'll have respect for you when you actually figure out who you are. Um, And so I I think, I don't think that requires any further commentary. We're just going to do uh, one more today, which I think uh, is a nice short one to round off this discussion of sort of the aristocracy or plebeianism of the soul. 267, quote, The Chinese have a proverb that mothers even teach children. Xiao Sen, make your heart small. This is characteristic, sorry, this is the characteristic, fundamental propensity in late civilizations. I do not doubt that an ancient Greek would recognize in us Europeans of today, too, such self-diminution. This alone would suffice for us to offend his taste. End quote. So, you know, <laughs> we would offend his taste, right? It's funny the way Nietzsche puts it, but it it shows you that it would be a matter of the heart, a matter of feeling uh, for the ancient Greek, a more noble type of person. That revulsion, he would have that contempt for the majority of us in modern times that um, this idea of making your heart small, make your ambition small, your desire, your passions, all of of these um, Christian ideas of, or Stoic ideas of curbing the passions, curbing your ambition, uh, curbing your enthusiasm, if you will, and uh, resigning yourself to a mediocre life, as Nietzsche said earlier in the passage, become mediocre is the only real moral message that is preached today. And this drive, this will to mediocrity is the kind of thing that would have a person of the master morality look at us with um, that kind of that contempt. And, you know, as it's been said uh, before, one of the best ways to explore history and try to understand history is not to consider what moral judgments you would pass on them, but which moral judgments they would pass on you. And much of Nietzsche's project is almost an evaluation of our modern society from the perspective of an ancient Greek. And if you think the point of that is necessarily for Nietzsche to say, we have to go back to the way the ancient Greek did things, I think you're misreading Nietzsche. I think what he's doing is shaking you out of your modern perspective and showing you that it is in fact a perspective. Wait, look, come stand over here at the ancient Greek perspective. That's been what most of this chapter is as regards the ancient Greek view on society and politics, which you could say this chapter is about, but more broadly, it's about what Nietzsche thinks is a more natural life affirming view of, um, you know, just the, human man in society, um, both man in society and man in 
man himself and society itself and the relationship between them. And by inhabiting that inverse perspective, we learn something about all perspectives. We, we gain a direct insight into perspectivism. If even for a moment, you find yourself sliding into that ancient Greek view and seeing with the same eyes and recognizing the ways in which your thought is not patterned by these, you know, strictly logical pathways of thought, but is premised on value judgments and that those don't come from a rational place. They're pre-rational, non-rational, and that so much of what you're bringing to bear in your interpretation of the world and your own morality and your ideas about metaphysics and epistemology and everything else that you believe has mostly just been handed to you, um, that you, you're regurgitating what you've been fed and uh, just not even having the, the understanding that what you're saying is a contingent truth. Um, and so by making us aware of that contingency, of our viewpoints on things as springing from values, which we receive as a result of being born in a particular time and place. It's the easiest way to put it. Um, by showing us that we can gain more perspective, as I've said before. And from there, I mean, you can go back to the beginning of the book, Beyond Good and Evil, and consider all of the implications of that. And so uh, with that, I think uh, this might be overly ambitious, but I think we're going to finish this book in the next episode, which is very exciting. Um, there's going to be a very short break when we're done with the book um, where I just need to get a little more time to get things prepared and then we're launching into season four. You know, I keep teasing it, but it's, you know, it's on my mind <laughs> and it's what all my work and effort intellectually has been going into. Um, of late. So very excited for all that. And these final aphorisms um, are some of my favorite. So, all right, everyone, that's all. Signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.